She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to Coffee and True Crime Time. It's been a day already, so forgive me if I seem a little off because I am definitely a little off. I forced myself to finish the Metal and McCann documentary. Forced was the best word that I could use because I had to really psych myself up to watch episode eight. And then I had to watch episode seven again because there was such a big gap of time between when I watched episode seven and when I watched episode eight that I forgot what happened in episode seven because it was so unmemorable that I had to rewatch it. So I kind of screwed myself there. So we'll talk about episode seven, we'll talk about episode eight, and then I'll give you my final thoughts. And I'll also tell you some really key events and details that the documentary conveniently left out and why I think that happened. Episode seven tells us how bad the McCanns are at picking private investigators to help them find their daughter. First you have Francisco Marco and Francisco Marco, he was the owner of the firm that Julian worked for and Julian was the guy we talked about a couple episodes ago who I really liked. I thought he seemed pretty genuine but apparently his boss is a scumbag. Francisco Marco basically said, I know where Madeline is, I know what happened to her, I know who took her, and we're, we're closing in, you know? So this gave the McCanns and everybody else hope. When in fact, according to Julian, he never knew anything, and the only reason that he said he did was to get publicity for the firm, which doesn't actually make any sense in the long run if you think about it, because eventually everybody's gonna realize that you didn't know shit, and that doesn't really look good for your firm, so I feel like that backfired. If that was his plan, it was a bad one. Then you had the American private investigative firm called Oakley International, and the guy who was running the lead on the McCann investigation for Oakley International was named Kevin Halligan, and he turns out as well to be a scumbag and a con man. Kevin Halligan was actually an Irish native. He was pretending to be a private investigator. Either way, he pretty much just made everything up. He said he had these satellite images of the night and time that Madeline would have been kidnapped that he got from the FBI or the CIA, secret government agency satellite pictures that would show exactly what happened. And it turned out that they were Google Earth images that, that anybody could get. And he kept saying he was doing stuff like he was hiring a couple who had a child that was the same age and type as Madeline to draw the kidnappers out. And he had hired a drunken priest to, I don't know, listen to confessions and tell him what, what was said. So this guy thinks he's like James Bond or something. When he did get caught, because he was basically taking a crap ton of money, I think it was something like 300 or 400,000 pounds that he was paid and he was just spending it on first class plane tickets and um, expensive hotel rooms and basically just living the life on the Madeline Fund's dime and not actually doing anything at all. So when he got found out, he, he fled to Rome and then the guy who was tracking him and trying to find him, I forget the guy's name, he's not Jerry or Kate McCann, he's just some other guy. But this guy was tracking him and <laughs> Kevin Halligan sent him the lyrics to Gangster's Paradise as a threat. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> I can't take it. That was kind of funny. It's clear that the McCanns just had terrible, terrible luck when it came to private investigators. It really pissed me off because this became a game of how can we use this little girl's disappearance to our advantage. And then when the private investigators were basically not doing their job, now all of a sudden everybody's preoccupied 
with trying to figure them out and find them and you know point their wrongdoings out and it just became a game of you were wrong or you were wrong or you were doing your job or you're taking too much money for this instead of actually what should have been the focus which was Madeline the whole time. Kevin Halligan was never actually like brought up on charges or proven to have been you know embezzling money um, but he died January of 2018 from an acute subdural hemorrhage in his lavish mansion in Normandy. So I guess we'll never know. In episode seven, you also had a lot of talk about the dark web, about child trafficking on the dark web. You had talk about this huge Belgium pedophile ring that apparently everybody knew about except Belgium. There was this tip that someone took a photo of Maddie and sent it to a purchaser in Belgium and once the purchaser said she was suitable, that's when Maddie was taken. And this tip was recorded by an intelligence officer working for Scotland Yard's vice unit. I looked a little bit deeper into this fact of the picture taken of Maddie and her being sold in the docuseries really tried hard to make it seem as if it was a fact, even putting up a picture of you know a, a really official looking document saying all this it was not a fact it was second or third hand information at best and there was actually no corroborating evidence that this even happened the guy who got the tip couldn't even remember or point to where it had come from or who said it where they were from so pretty much just another one of those things that gets said enough and gets put into enough documentaries and becomes a fact. When asked for a comment about this pedophile ring in Belgium that buys and sells children from all over the world, the Belgium Federal Police stated, we find it a little bit strange. We are not aware and we have never found a network in Belgium that could order, sell, or buy children like this. Then we had the Smiths sighting, or what everybody calls Smith Man, which is basically the man who was walking by the McCann apartment that was seen by an Irish family who were also on vacation, and they were the Smith family, and they all saw this man carrying a little girl in pajamas. They described the man they saw carrying the little girl away, and they basically came up with these sketches, and these are the famous sketches that everybody says looks like the Podesta brothers, John and Tony Podesta, who we'll get to them in a minute or a couple minutes, but it does look like, it does look like them. <laughs> But then when Kate and Jerry went back to the UK and there was video of them getting off the plane with their twins and Jerry was carrying one of the twins, the Smith family saw this video and they said, oh, that's the man that we saw carrying the little girl that night just in this exact way that he's carrying this little child now. So then everybody went on this whole thing saying that it was Jerry who the Smiths had seen carrying Maddie that night. So not John and Tony Podesta, but Jerry McCann. Episode seven also saw Kate, Jerry, and Robert Murat be unnamed Arguidos or unnamed suspects. You know, they're cleared of being involved in the case and the case is shelved. Basically, they're not looking into it any longer in Portugal. And then everybody's throwing shade at Gonzalo Amaral in this, this documentary for writing a book for his own financial gain. And I, I'm sitting over here like, wait, didn't, didn't Kate McCann write a book too? Why is Kate allowed to write a book for her financial gain, but nobody else is allowed to write a book for their financial gain? And weren't that other couple that were in the docu-series, the ones that were always talking about the McCanns in such a glowing way, didn't they write a book? Netflix and Pulse have been tight-lipped over potential revelations in the series, but provided variety with a list of interviewees. They include Anthony Summers and Robin Swan, the investigative journalist who co-wrote 2015's Looking for Madeline. That one older guy and the dark-haired lady that were always talking like they knew everything, they wrote a book too, I'm sure for financial gain. And Gonzalo Amaral, he alleges that Jerry McCann came to Portugal at one point to meet with the Social Democrats to block him from becoming a mayoral candidate. And then obviously the McCanns and their legal defense completely deny that this happened. And the McCanns brought Gonzalo Amaral to court and they wanted all the copies of his book destroyed 
which really bothered me. Like, what is this Fahrenheit 451? You might not like what somebody's writing, but you can't just call for a book burning if you don't like the book. It's absolutely ridiculous. So then apparently a judge banned all further sales of the book, which was called The Truth of the Lie, but then this was overturned on appeal. So in the end, I guess Gonzalo Amaro won the whole thing, but they were very careful in the documentary to put that information in in really small text that disappeared before you could read it. You know, everybody else is talking about how bad he is for writing the book, how slanderous it is, how he was, you know, going to get brought to court and sued, and then when it actually comes out in the end that the judge said whatever he wrote was, was good enough to still be published, they put that in this tiny little text that you have to pause the video to actually read because it like appears gradually and then disappears gradually, so it, it was stupid. It was really hard to read, really small, especially if you're watching on your phone on the treadmill, which I was. But I thought that was cool how they like slipped that in there. And they talk about a series of random things and events that could mean anything or be anything, like a woman in Barcelona who ran up to a guy and asked, where's my daughter? Where's my new daughter? Do you have my daughter? And she kept asking him, like, where's my new daughter? And, and then she figured out he was the wrong person to talk to and she ran away all terrified. And the guy said she looked like Victoria Beckham. Then there was a man spotted by the McCann's apartment in Portugal who was closing the gate really stealthily, you know, sneakily even. Let's move on to episode eight, where Robert Murat sues for a libel and he actually wins and he gets 600,000 pounds, which is a lot. And then episode eight literally goes into a whole pointless thing about ethics and morals in the British media that is uh, completely unrelated to Madeline's disappearance or finding her, but yet we waste like a good 10 to 15 minutes on it. They then show Kate and Jerry at a press conference where Kate appears to be promoting her book that she wrote about Madeline, yet they never mention Kate writing a book about Madeline or the things that she said in it. Then you have the Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, in 2012 reopening the Madeline McCann case, and they called it Operation Grange. Finally, 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 they talk about how Tanner Man was just a regular guy, another tourist, another British tourist at the resort, bringing his child back from the night daycare. Finally, in the last episode, the truth comes out. There's no Tanner man, there's no Jane Tanner sighting. And the knife pencil sharpening FBI analysis seems really pleased with herself that the faceless man that she drew from Jane Tanner's description of this person she saw carrying the child really matched the guy who came forward and said that he was the one carrying the child. She seemed really pleased with herself. She was like, oh, thank you. I do think it looks a lot like him. <laughs> I can't take it, guys. I can't take it. This was such a waste of time. I'm so glad. If you guys are coming here for like a wrap up or a sort of um, cliff notes version of what happened in this documentary, I'm so glad that I'm saving you the absolute pain and torture of having to watch it. And in episode eight, we talk a little bit about the Matt Oldfield check. Now, I've always questioned Matt's check on the kids, right? So apparently Jerry was the one who checked first and then some other people checked on their kids and then Kate was getting up to check on the kids and her friend Matt Oldfield said, well, I'm checking on my kids. I'll just check on yours while I'm there. And she said, okay. And I always had this sneaking suspicion that he never even went into the McCann's apartment when he went to go check at this point because he came back to the table and he said, everything's quiet or everything sounds quiet, which gives me the impression that he kind of maybe just opened the door and listened in to make sure the kids weren't crying because why would you, you know, they're not your kids. Why are you going to go in, open the door to the bedroom, look in there to make sure they're okay. You're just going to open the door here if they're crying or not. If they're not, you're going to close it and move on with your night. But that author we were just talking about, Anthony Summers, that older guy in the docu-series who wrote the book about Madeline McCann, he says uh, that Matthew Oldfield said he heard a noise inside the room, which he assumed was just one of the kids turning over in their sleep. But then this Anthony guy says, is it possible that noise was someone kidnapping Maddie? And I hate 
the way that people use that is it possible thing like yeah anything's possible if you say it like that is it possible that matt oldfield never even went into the mccann's apartment just opened the door to see if the kids were crying and when he heard they weren't closed the door and went on his way so we don't actually know if madeline mccann was in the room at this point so this could change the timeline completely is it possible see how that works it's just like needless sensationalism. You know, you can say that, is it possible like that before anything? And then, you know, people will be like, huh, it is possible. It is. Is it actually possible that Matt Oldfield went in and he was looking into the apartment and he heard a noise in the bedroom and that somebody was literally physically abducting Madeline McCann at that moment? I think it's less possible than the fact that he probably just never even went in the apartment and just made sure the kids weren't crying and then went on his way. But Anthony Summers is a best-selling nonfiction author, so what do I know? Is it possible? <laughs> episode eight, thank God it was the last episode because it pissed me off more than any of them have. More than any of them have. They constantly bring up the most random, pointless stuff in this episode. There's men lurking around the apartment building in the week leading up to Madeline's disappearance. Two blonde men that are leaning against, you know, the wall by the apartment. Then there's another guy who was described as having a pockmarked face and they made a picture of this guy. It looks like Abe Lincoln with chicken pox. And they kept saying the word lurking, lurking. There was people lurking by the apartment. They were lurking there. Just saying the word lurking makes it sound ominous. When in fact, as it has been described multiple times, this part of Pride Deluge was a tourist area. It was well-traveled. There was a lot of foot traffic. It, there was tourists and locals. There was always people walking around. So why is somebody leaning against a wall by an apartment on a public street lurking? Because they want to make it sound ominous. They want to make it seem like she was kidnapped. I don't know if she was kidnapped. I don't know if she wasn't kidnapped, but I do know that this documentary if we can call it that at this point, went out of its way to make that seem as if it was the only option. And I don't like that. And you know that's what they're doing because then the eyewitness who allows herself to be interviewed for this documentary literally says this, they must have been there for one reason, which was to take Madeline. Where do you get your information from? Why do you think that they must have been there for one reason and that one reason was to take Madeline? This is insane to say that. What if they were waiting for a friend who was in another apartment? What if they had been walking and they were thirsty and they just wanted to stop and take in, you know, a breeze and chill out for a second? Why is the one reason that they were there to take Madeline? It's just these ridiculous statements. People who were lurking, just being there for one reason to take Madeline. This docu-series, if we can call it that at this point, is literally just trying to shove into your head, this was ominous, this was dangerous. There was a lot of lurky people around with pockmarked faces who had bad intentions. We don't actually know that. That's the point, they could have been lurking, they could have had bad intentions, but we don't know that. So for this program, to make it seem like that is the only option, that that's exactly what their motive was, as if it's a fact, it makes me mad. I gotta get my phone for the rest of my notes because I was on the treadmill when I made them. So then they talk a little bit about how Kate and Jerry and their party had basically booked the tapas bar, that table that they wanted for the entire week and that the people who had made the reservation wrote in the reservation book these people need this table because they've left their kids alone in the hotel room and they want to be able to check in on them. So Kate was upset because she said this reservation book was right there. It was public. Anybody who, you know, had nefarious intentions would have been able to see it. Yes, they would have been able to see information that you willingly gave so that you could get the table that you wanted every night for a week when booking for an entire week like that wasn't even allowed at this resort you had to go every day to book your table in the morning and a lot of resorts are kind of like that the restaurants fill up really quick so you have to go and make sure like in the morning you can get your spot at the restaurant that night because they do fill up quickly but 
this restaurant allowed the McCanns and their party to book that table for the entire week and other um, tourists were even a little agitated by it because they were like, well, why can they do it and nobody else can? Because they used their kids being alone in their apartment as chess pieces in order to get the table that they wanted at the restaurant they wanted every night for the whole week. You gave that information, Kate. You volunteered that information. How can you be mad that it was written in a reservation book when that's information that they wouldn't have had if you hadn't given it? All right, let's quickly go over what was left out in this documentary, if we can call it that at this point. <laughs> so the whole Clement Freud connection um, completely never mentioned. Clement Freud is the grandson of a Sigmund Freud and a known pedophile and sexual predator. And he lived right around the corner. And after Madeline's disappearance, he invited Kate and Jerry over to his house for lunch and drinks and made inappropriate comments to Kate. And in Kate's book, she writes, what a great dear friend he was to her. You know, he made her laugh and made her forget about the horrible things that were happening. And if you want to see my whole take on this, go watch my video on the Madeline McCann case where I go deeply into the whole Sigmund Freud connection and what happened when they went to dinner and lunches at his house and the things that were said, but doesn't it seem weird? And I know, like, obviously he was not brought up on these charges until 2016, seven years after he passed away, it became known. But now knowing what we know, doesn't it seem odd that he was there right around the corner the whole time? Another thing that I found strange that wasn't in the docuseries was that all these friends that traveled together, they took turns watching each other's kids and bathing each other's kids, which I find very, very strange. There's never going to be a time where I let my, my personally, my two-year-old daughter be bathed by another man who's not my husband or her father. Like it would never ever happen. So I thought it was weird that they, kind of shared those duties. Maybe I'm too American or it's something you all do in Europe. I don't know, you let me know. Cause every time I say, it's weird to leave your kids alone in an apartment, I get comments like, that's what we do here in Europe. Like, shut up you stupid American. <laughs> But that's gonna lead me to the Gasper statements. And I'm not gonna go too far into the Gasper statements because it's disturbing but you can Google it, G-A-S-P-A-R statements, or I will actually just put a link in the description box. And the Gaspers were friends of Kate and Jerry's. They were both doctors. Um, the husband basically went to school with Kate, so he'd known her for a while. And they used to go on vacation with the McCanns as well. They went to the McCann's wedding and they all were friends. They all went on vacations together. So in September of 2005, the Gaspers went on vacation. They holidayed with Kate, Jerry, Madeline, who was two and a half years old at that time, the twins, Sean and Emily, who were only a few months old. There were also other friends of Kate and Jerry with them there. There was a couple, Dave and Fiona, the Paines. So around the fourth or fifth day on their holiday, there was an incident that happened that made the gas bars kind of take a step back and wonder what was going on. And it happened when they were all outside sitting on a patio outside of the house. They'd been eating and drinking. The wife, Catherine Gasper, she was sitting between Jerry and David Payne and they were having a very inappropriate conversation about the little girls, their daughters. I'm not going to go into detail here because it's just, it's gross, but I will link the Gaspers statement right in my description box and you guys can go check it out. But I didn't hear the docu-series mention anything about the Gaspers statement. Why? Because they don't want you to know. Another thing that really struck me as odd, and there was a lot of inconsistencies in Kate and Jerry's story in the beginning, but one of the things that bothered me the most was how Kate and Jerry both told people separately and together that the blinds had been damaged when the person broke in to get Maddie. The blinds had been damaged. They even said they'd been jimmied so that the person could come in and get Maddie because they'd locked the door. Now the door was never locked. The doors were left unlocked so that they could get in and out of the apartment. Additionally, the blinds were not damaged in any way, shape or form. They weren't jimmied nobody had broken them. Nobody had damaged them. So why did Kate and Jerry say that they'd been damaged and jimmied 
and that the doors had been locked. And one last thing before I leave you, there was an upstairs neighbor of the McCanns at their holiday apartment in Portugal. And I think it was a couple nights before Madeline went missing, this upstairs neighbor, who was a nice older lady, she said that she heard Madeline crying for several hours, for several hours. I think it was almost four hours Madeline was crying for her father until finally the adults came home and Madeline stopped crying. Now, why is this important? This is important because if the McCanns were in fact and truly checking on the children every 20 to 30 minutes, why would Madeline be crying for almost four hours straight? This gives me the impression that they were not checking on them every 20 to 30 minutes. Why is that important? Besides the fact that it's neglectful, besides the fact that anything could happen to your small children while you're gone for 20 minutes, much less for several hours, it completely changes the timeline of when you might be looking for Madeline. Because if you're saying you've checked on her this many times, so she could have only gone missing between this time and this time, when you put in that crazy kind of idea that maybe they hadn't checked on them at all that night, it means any time between when they left for dinner and when they discovered Madeline was missing, she could have been taken. Any time. And the thing that always does bother me is the fact that once Kate realized Madeline was missing from the apartment, she ran out and left the other two children sleeping in the apartment to go tell everybody Madeline was gone. If you thought she'd been taken, if you thought there was somebody out there kidnapping children, why would you ever, ever, ever do that? My final thoughts on the docuseries, it could have been two episodes instead of eight. All the random B-roll of people sharpening their pencils with knives, this dude Julian, the private investigator, constantly driving in his car and smoking cigarettes and B-roll, like, what is this? What, what is this? Do you remember that old show it was called homicide life on the streets it kind of reminded me of that kind of like this grungy sort of b-roll kind of trying to show you emotion without telling you that there's emotion there i just i thought it was pointless and i thought it was stretched out and it was clearly biased and slanted to the mccann's they're trying to really push this theory that madeline could be alive out there still i obviously hope she is alive out there still but I don't believe that she is. Personally, in my heart, I don't believe that anybody would kidnap a three-year-old and, and keep her around forever. If somebody did kidnap her, and that's what drives me crazy too, is they're trying to push this whole sex trafficking, pedophile ring kind of thing. And if they knew anything about these pedophile rings, then they would know she's probably not alive still because that's not how those organizations work. It's just not, unfortunately. So they really can't push this whole narrative that it's a sex trafficking ring, a child pedophile organizations that they kept throwing in there, random child pedophile organizations, just trying to show us that they exist, just, just trying to push them into our, our mind because they know it makes people uncomfortable because they know people don't wanna think about it so they won't think too much about it. They'll just accept it so that they can move on from this uncomfortable thought that nobody wants to think about. And if she was, is it likely that she's still alive? Because they're trying to push both of these narratives and you can really only believe one or the other. I still think there's something off with the whole situation. I think that this has been almost a staged case since the beginning. Like it's always been what they've all wanted us to see instead of what's really there and what's really happening. And as I'm sure was the point of this program, it left people confused and it left people second guessing what they thought before. And if that gets more funding to search for Madeline and that's the goal, then great. I don't think anybody should ever stop looking. But I think it's really irresponsible reporting to gloss over or ignore completely the things that really need to be put into the case and put into these docu-series so that the whole body of evidence can be taken into consideration. And it's almost insulting that these documentary makers think that the general public is so stupid that they'll accept whatever they're spoon-fed that the general public is too dumb to look at an entire case and an entire body of evidence and come to their own conclusions. So they have to pretty much take your hand 
and lead you to the conclusion they want you to arrive at. And it's offensive to me. I'm so happy to be done with this docu-series and on to the next one. I'm gonna start the Gypsy Rose one and I also wanna talk a little bit about Jesse Smollett's on our next coffee and crime time, but for now. But for now, I shall say goodbye. Let me know what you think about the whole thing if you saw the documentary. If you're glad you didn't, because if I was you, I'd be glad I didn't. And let me know if you agree with my conclusions or if you have different ones. I will see you very soon, very soon. Part three of the Andrew Cunanan Serial Killers series should be coming very soon, within the next couple of days. I am working on it. Stay kind and stay beautiful. I love you so much and I'll see you soon. Bye. It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate I take my pleasure from my alcohol She'll never give you 